Hey guys, welcome to Hook the Kayak Anglers Resource. Jonathan, here we go again, buddy. Man, we are back at it, and I'm, dude, I'm excited about this one. I am excited to talk to Jeff Little, uh, Mr. Torquedo. Um, National sales manager at Torquedo, and even better than that, serious kayak angler. It's just crazy. Like, just after talking, I'm like, there's so much stuff that I can just soak up and so much knowledge there. Um, it's amazing. Like, I'm so glad that Jeff's come on here and joined us. A lot of fun. Jeff came in here one time uh, into the shop here in, in Lake of the Ozarks, and, you know, your typical sales rep, he is not. Uh, you know, they come in, and i and, uh, not knocking anybody, but they come in, they kind of check what you got, what you're doing, see what you need, and they're gone. Off to the next one. Jeff came in, uh, was here for about three three hours, um, went over the Torquedo stuff uh, in about a 15-minute period, and then we just talked fishing. And not only fishing, but, um, you know, different products for, for kayaks and different ways to do it, and we'll get into some of that with him. But, uh, man, a good guy and, and, and just a plethora of knowledge. And uh, I don't even know what plethora means, <laughs> but I've heard it said. And if it's that's what it is, that's what he is. Because I'll tell you what, I learned from him every time we talk. Uh, so, guys, we're super excited about that. But Jonathan and I just got back from a little trip down to Norfolk in Arkansas. Did a little bit of fishing. Um, I had talked last week about uh, taking the NAR out. Um, the Jackson NAR took it out. Um, great boat. Great boat. It really enjoyed it. Um, uh, probably a personal note was it's a little, it's a little heavy, a little big for me. Um, that's coming from a 106, um, in Coda, uh, old town. But, um, I tell you, and you're in the PA 14, so this is something you're probably pretty used to, but, uh, or getting used to, cause you haven't had that boat long, but, um, I tell you where the industry is going with some of this rod management is pretty impressive. I, I, I did really enjoy you know that being able to put six rods in the hole of your boat um i like the track system so that you can uh you know you can keep uh keep your stuff out of the way and off the side of the boat i did let one frosty beverage <laughs> drop right into the lake got made fun of on that a little bit but um uh had a lot of fun with the boat um jackson i think is has really really you know done a good job with that boat so um if anybody wants to see that, come on in. We'll put you in one and let you let you test drive it. Um, I highly suggest that. But we had a lot of fun. We we actually got uh, we had a uh, 136 autopilot, a 106 pedal drive, uh, Jonathan's PA 14, and that NAR, and we all just kind of switched around a little bit. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan's fiance jumped in the NAR and pedaled it for a little bit, and and uh, which she's usually in that 106, and uh, uh, her legs are a little more tired. Yeah. From that. She, she was a little, she, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, pedaling back and she was in there and, and it definitely take, took more energy to, to pedal that NAR. But I mean, it is a bigger boat, bigger platform uh, compared to the, that, that sportsman, you know, 106. But uh, I, I think that Jackson has, you know, stepped out of their comfort zone with this boat. They've kind of, you know, reached to, to more anglers rather than just the river ones. Um, you know, we sat down and talked about it and, and kind of went through like what we liked and what we didn't like. And is it, is it worth it? Is it, you know, should we motor it? Should we not motor it? Uh, I think it really depends on the angler. I think it depends on, you know, a budget, uh, what they're looking at there, but it's got a lot of cool features. I will say that track system, having the three sides to mount stuff, um, you know, whether it's rods, whether it's rod holders, uh, cup holders, um, tackle bins, whatever it is, I, I think they've really knocked that out of the park. And I really think they've opened up a new space for like Yak Attack and Railblazer to definitely step out of the box um, in order to maximize that track system. Um, it'd be really cool to see, you know, if further on down the line, if they start selling that as an accessory and seeing it on other boats. Maybe they never do. Maybe they leave it on their boat and call it good. But um, it really opens up. Um, in that creative process to setting up your boat and what you what you want to do. Um, just like the PA-14, I, I love the horizontal storage. It's nice having those rods tucked away. Um, you know, we took it to the lake. Um, Jackson's known for having a river kayak, and I am curious to see how it would do on a river being a bigger boat. Yeah. Um, it may not pedal as great, um, but, I mean, that hole may, um, you know, 
take on that current, you know, or that, that swifter water better than a bigger boat in its class. Yeah, we're going to have to put Garrett Reed in it and let him get out. I know he's a, you know, he has the bite uh, with the, with, uh, um, not with the flex drive. So we're going to have to get him out in one and let him test it. He's kind of our river stick. So um, have to put him in it and see what he thinks. Um, you know, I, I like, I really liked uh, the boat. Um, it, it would have an 1103 Torquedo on it as soon as I bought it, if I, if I own the boat, um, because I'm just old. And, uh, and the, the pedaling was, was a lot for me. But, but uh, I liked the boat. I enjoyed it. Um, it's a dang good looking boat. Uh, we took it out in the Tiger Shark. Um, I like the way this, the seat, um, the mobility on the seat it was great. Uh, the seat height, um, adjustable adjustability was really good. And I like setting up high. So um, I enjoyed the boat. So we had a good time. Uh, we did catch some fish. Um, uh, had a good time. I had a about a 12 incher that fought me for about 20 <laughs> minutes trying to uh, get him on a catch board just to just to check him out. But uh, no, we had a we had a really good time. And if you ever get a chance to go down to Norfolk or Bull Shoals, I think those are those are great bodies of water. And uh, we were pre fishing. Um, got a tournament next weekend um, up at Norfolk, and uh, hopefully uh, Jonathan can can put a little cash in his pocket and and uh, stand up there and hold a big check. Yeah, that'd be pretty sweet. Uh, I think the uh, the uh, pre fishing is still going on. I'm gonna head down there um, later this week and see if I can get on some fish. But it's definitely uh, you know it reminds me of Table Rock. It's a little bit like Bull Shoals, but uh, it's it's definitely a different body of water. And plus it's I mean, dog days of summer right now. It's tough. Yeah. So, I mean, fishing, that's the way it is. So, we'll see what happens. But, yeah, I'm excited about this event and get down there. But I think enough about that in the NAR. I think we need to get in here, uh, talk to Jeff, and just soak up some knowledge, man. Yeah, coming to you. Here he comes. Hey, guys, we want to welcome Jeff Little from Torquedo to the show. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk to Jeff a little bit about Torquedo, what they're doing, uh, and more importantly, we're going to move into some smallmouth fishing, which is what we're all excited to talk about. So, uh, Jeff, just give us a, a quick rundown of kind of what's going on with Torquedo and, and what the um, what do you guys see coming up in the in the in the near future? And and uh, you know, we do the four hundred three and the eleven hundred three, and the great products. We've had a lot of luck with them. Uh, we have one angler, Robbie Brewer, uh, on our pro staff that runs a uh, a four hundred three on his uh, Van Hunk Shad. Absolutely loves the product. So. I'm going to let you just chat a little bit about Torquedo and just let us know kind of what's going on. Sure. Uh, Torquedo is a, well, it's a German company. There's two guys that uh, were actually, that started it, that were um, product engineers for Gardenia, like gardening supplies. And they, um, <clears throat> you know, they, they went boating on this, every weekend on this lake in Germany that's electric only. Similar to we, you know, we have some electric only reservoirs are usually municipal water supply <clears throat> reservoirs. I live in Maryland and we have like Baltimore's municipal uh, water supply, Pretty Boy, Black Raven, Liberty Reservoir is a really big one. And they do actually do tournaments on there um, that use our, we have a six, a 9.9 .9, and a 25 horsepower for, for John boats. Um, in addition to obviously you guys know the, the travel and the ultralight for, for kayaks, but these two guys, you know, were using whatever was commercially available. And they said, you know, th this isn't enough. There's not enough, you know, not enough kick and not enough power, not enough speed. And they're smart guys. And they just said, we'll, we'll come up with something. And they use things like rare earth magnets, which are like six or seven times more powerful per, per weight of a magnet uh, compared to like ferrite magnets that are in trolling motors. Um, they, they came up with a different design of, of how those magnets oriented around the, the copper. Um, they worked with a, a um, prop designer that did stuff for like submarines and commercial ships. Like they've, you know, they really did some things that, that made a really super efficient, powerful motor, and they they were just doing it for their only use, their their personal use. And everyone saw them just zipping around, going really fast. They're like, "Wow, where'd you get that?" And they said, "Well, we made it. Well, can you make another and another and another?" And before too long, they're not Gardenia employees. <laughs> you know, they're, they're starting Torquedo, and um, that's really where the company, you know, was born on electric only lakes. 
in in Germany. Uh, in like I said, the municipal water supply reservoirs. We have those all over, especially the East Coast. Um, we have a team torpedo angler, uh, Brett Cummings, who's he runs a um, you know it's it's Facebook and YouTube to it's mostly Facebook is is decked out John boats. So it's it's uh, it kind of runs in the same lanes as like Tiny Boat Nation, uh, but it really just focuses on that electric only scene. Uh, that's going on uh, in Georgia, in particular. They have a lot of electric-only tournaments for John boats. Uh, Virginia, some in the Carolinas. I know there's some series up in Ohio. A lot here. Well, I say a lot, but it's the ones here in Maryland are some of the biggest electric-only lakes anywhere because they're they're it's either Washington D.C. or Baltimore's water supply reservoirs, and those were built like in the 20s. And they just built them big because they knew that these two, you know, metro areas were going to be big and needed that water supply. So, but on the kayak side, uh, it started with, honestly, it started with Chad Hoover being in the Navy and being stationed in Stuttgart. And he was stationed over there. And he also worked with Heroes on the Water when he's when he was back home in the States in, in uh, Virginia Beach or Norfolk. And he worked with the, the veterans that are that are missing limbs in in Heroes on the Water gets folks out, you know, gets those uh, disabled veterans out there and get some kayak fishing. And he somehow met one of the two founders of Torquedo and said, you know, um, I think this would really work for getting those veterans out there. When he came back, that was about the time that he was he was really getting kayak bass fishing going, right? And it was his tournament series. Nobody else was doing it. And he said, yeah, I want a provision for, for there to be motors so that our veterans can, your disabled veterans can do it. And he also sort of understood, hey, if there's, if there's, you know, not a market for these because we're allowing them in competition, they just, they won't be around. They won't develop. So that was his foresight to say motors on kayaks are good. <clears throat> a, a sort of an altruistic reasoning. Um, he pushed them on, one my way and I pushed it away. <laughs> I really did. Because <laughs> at the time, I mean, I, I've been kayak fishing since 1998. In 2001, I earned um, American Canoe Association certification as a paddling instructor. Primarily, I mean, it was a whitewater certification, but it was like the lowest level that you can get. And uh, I wasn't teaching people how to do the role or to do all the, you know, the fancy tricks they do in the whitewater. I just wanted someone, I wanted to teach people about kayak fishing in a way that they avoided some of the problems that I ran into early on, like, you know, flipping a kayak and losing all my gear in a strainer on the Potomac River. And, you know, I was a kayak fishing guide in instructor from 2001 to 2011. And, you know, I think, I think it was probably towards the end of that, that Chad kind of pushed a Torquedo Ultralight 402 in my direction. I said, I don't want it. Like I'm, I'm a paddling guy. You know, I just, this is what I do. I teach people how to paddle and, and to teach them, you know, all of these, these whitewater maneuvers. And, and like, it just, with what I do, the motor doesn't fit. And he kind of said, yeah, you'll come around. Said, no, I won't. I'm, I'm <laughs> and, you know, I, I think I went down there to film with him for his TV show. And, uh, like I stayed with him down in Virginia beach and he, um, you know, I was down there for like three or four days and I woke up the next, you know, just to, to, you know, to leave that, you know, the morning of the last day. And there was a wilderness systems commander 120 with an ultralight 402 on it, on the, already on the top of my vehicle. I'm like, what are you doing, man? He's like, listen, I'm not here to, you're, you're taking this for two months. Uh, I go on cruise, you know, for, for that long, when I come back, then I'll come get it. But you need to try this. 
And I think I did like once or twice. I actually took it on one of the electric only reservoirs here in Maryland and explored a section of, the, of that reservoir that I had never been to before and thought, yeah, this is cool. I, you know, I, I, I got to explore more than I would have, you know, maybe, and I don't even know if I admitted it then, but that's really <laughs> what happened. And really that's what eventually I came back to it and said, yeah, I, I want to, I want this for fish in the Chesapeake Bay for striper. Cause that's this vast area that like you need to cover distance to find fish, you know, striper move fast in, in, they could be, here in this, in this, you know, tidal river on the inside turn, you know, on the outgoing tide, you know, to today, and you come back tomorrow, they're gone and they're, you know, they're three miles on the other side of it. So I, I came around and I'm like, yeah, I think I, I want it for my, you know, my Chesapeake boat. And um, I learned that it, that motors on kayaks, is something that gives you tremendous range and and the speed is fun right like we have the ultralight 1103 that can i think the fastest i've gone is 7.6 mile per hour on wilderness systems thresher 155 most boats are getting in that six and a half mile an hour range um <clears throat> but the longest distance that i've covered with the battery that it comes with um is you know not at six and a half mile an hour but we did a day on the bay where we averaged 2.8 miles per hour trolling yozuri crystal flashman on either side so it was it was marty Mood and myself and uh we covered 41.8 miles that day with and i did it with one battery he got into the second one because he actually had the 403 instead of the 1103 the 1103 is more efficient with the power you give it so Wow, I got that over forty mile day with with one battery. So you know, talking about batteries, and and of course, you know, there's other motors that are similar to the Torquedo and whatnot. Um, do you guys ever see Torquedo going to a, an option where you can run a lithium battery or a, a larger battery or or anything like that? So they do that with the cruise motor, uh, which is. A, either a six, a 9.9 .9 horsepower, or there's a 25 horsepower. You can use um, other brands of, of lithium batteries, but you, you lose the, some of the function of the data communication that really lets you know specifically how much range you have left. So let me, I'll come back to the ultralight, and, but I, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the short answer with the ultralight, no. <laughs> it'll always be that battery that comes with it. And, and here's some of why. Um, so the battery is, is IP67 rated waterproof, um, has this case that even if there is a lithium battery fire in there, it cannot burn its way out. They safety test the heck out of everything there. Like the, <laughs> it's fun listening to the German engineers talk about the the worst case scenario test that they do and not, you know, the, the dumpster fires, literally that they start to lower batteries <laughs> and see what happens. Right. Um, but there's a GPS unit in there that, that communicates the information of how fast you, what your speed is over land. It communicates that and you can see it on the throttle, right? I think it's the third number down. Um, <clears throat> it compares that with your, you know, your, your speed over land, your remaining battery percentage from zero to hundred percent, and then your watt draw. So from zero to, with the 1103, it's 1100 watts. <clears throat> Those three data points help calculate your remaining range at your current throttle setting. So you always know, sort of like a lot of vehicles have, you know, you have uh, 162.3 miles till your, till your gas tank is empty. It's like that, but it takes into account if you're going into a headwind or if, or if you're on a river going against current, which I do a lot. I mean, I do, you know, I travel the country and I like to just pick a point and I don't set up a float trip. I pick a point and I go upstream and just, just explore. And if I get to, you know, some riffles, I hop out and drag over and keep going. Um, <clears throat> but that remaining range 
ability. So say you're, well, say for the instance, the, the day on the Chesapeake where, you know, we did 41.8 miles. I knew that rounding that, that last northern point of, um, it was Love Point on Kent Island, coming into the Chester River, and <clears throat> we were fighting a headwind, and we were fighting the outgoing tide that was clipping along at like mm, close to, uh, it was pro if we sat still and just drifted with it, it was probably going about 1.7 mile an hour. So strong outgoing tide plus a headwind that built to breaking waves that occasionally would wash through our kayaks and hit us in the chest, you know, after dark. And I'm looking at the <laughs> throttle saying we have, uh, you know, at, at the current, you know, speed, if I pushed it to 2.8 miles per hour, um, you know, we only have three more miles of range. So that last stretch, in order to make it last, I said, okay, we're, we're not, you know, we're not going to maintain the trolling speed that we've been catching striped bass the whole time. I just want to see if we can get this trip done. And it was like six, I think it was 6.1 miles from Love Point down to, to turn into Kent Narrows. You know, and I backed off and, you know, I used the go-to and back then I was using the Humminbird Helix 10. I'd use the go-to function to like set a waypoint on the channel marker right where you go into, you know, where we'd end. And it'll tell you you have 6.1 miles, right? So you sit there and you play with the, the throttle until it gets right to 6.1 and you look at it and you're like, yep, I'm using, <clears throat> say... 42 watts to do that. And, and now instead of going 2.8, I'm going against this outgoing tide. I'm going, you know, 2.2 or something. But the point is that you can set it to a point to a setting that says, yes, now you can do your 6.1 miles. That allows you to, to explore just crazy distances and say in a pre-fishing uh, situation. A lot of folks do the, you know, go on these national uh, level, or even like the Hobie Bass Open series was here local to me on the Susquehanna. Um, but you know, say, you know, say it's a say it's a bigger lake, and someone's like, I've never been here, and I got three days to pre-fish, and I just want to take a look at what's out there, assess the forge, look at side imaging, figure out where. If it's a shad based lake, what depth they're setting up on. If there's certain windblown points that like, you know, mid morning just load up with shad on a certain side. You you pick up all that stuff by riding and looking, you know, and the more distance that you cover, if you're covering, you know, and it's not uncommon for people pre-fishing to cover, you know, 22, 28 miles in a day with the Torquedo Ultralight in, when you do that with a bigger fishery, you just figure out stuff, you find fish. So that kind of range, you know, mid, mid and upper twenties in a day where you're cruising along at, you know, um, three, three and a half mile an hour for like, I don't know, 12 hours, you, you figure out a lot. Yeah, I bet. So. I bet. Well, I went to, uh, I went to Maine a few years ago and, uh, Striper fished the Saco Bay. Yeah. And I cannot imagine doing that in a kayak. It was, it was phenomenal. It was the, some of the most fun fishing I've ever done. But, yeah, we were on the move a lot. Uh, not only chasing fish, but chasing bait fish. Um, yep. You know, catching and mackerel. Birds. And, and Fishers, chasing birds. Yeah, exactly. And uh, birds are a little quicker than a kayak, generally. So, uh, so I can't imagine. Let me show you where the fish are eating. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's amazing. That's awesome. I was just up there. We have uh, on Team Torquedo with Mike Baker, who's a kayak fishing guide up there, um, right in the Kenny Bunkport area. And I was there three weeks ago, and we we explored new water. Um, and, you know, we, and we caught him during the day, but he's like, if you really want to get into the bigger fish, we got to, we got to do a surf launch at night and, and go out and, and there'll be bigger ones there. And we got, I think I got two of them over 40 inches. Um, Mike and his, his, uh, his buddy 
did better. I mean, they, they each got like four or five that were 40 inches or better on these gravity tackle eels. Um, if, if you're curious, anyone who's listening to this wants to see what that looks like on video, I have that as a, as a video on my YouTube channel. Just if you look at the striped bass playlist on the little stuff YouTube channel. You'll uh, you'll find that trip with with uh, Mike Baker, and that's a great point. We we will uh, we'll attach your information on here so people can go look because your library is pretty amazing, and uh, you know I, I've learned a lot. Um, you know, well beyond Torquedo, just fishing and some of the stuff that you do um, is pretty impressive. Uh, you know, we've had uh, the NRS rival. Uh, star rival in here yeah. uh, inflatable kayak and you kind of look at it and it's kind of cool and and then you see jeff little out there with a torpedo on it and then it's super cool and every you know and uh i showed yeah. that video to a few people and i have no star rivals left they're gone because uh yeah. they're um i have a whole playlist on inflatable kayaks and the first one on there is <clears throat> how i rigged up that that particular boat with the torpedo in um you know, it's that's probably the most lightweight and maneuverable boat that I've set up with that three horsepower electric outboard, and it is so much fun. Um, generally, the the advantages of the inflatable, and, and and I've switched at least for now to to one made by Innovative Sportsman, which it's a it's a longer one. It's a fourteen footer instead of like twelve and a half. Bigger footprint. That bigger footprint means that you go just stupid shallow. If it's wet, you can go there. I mean, I say that, but I, with most rotomolded kayaks, if you if you look at the 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 depth, if you measure the mud line, it's between five and nine inches. So that means you need say seven inches to to get that kayak through there. The inflatable kayaks, at least the the uh, innovative Sportsman Osprey, fourteen thirty six, I. I ran into something that actually stopped me and I'm like, all right, I got to get out. And I ran back, actually ran back up to my truck. I got a tape measure. I'm like, I'm going to put the tape measure on this, see what, what the depth is. It was two and an eighth inch deep is what stopped me. So at two and a quarter, I keep going. So shallow draft is such a huge, huge advantage for, for inflatable kayaks. The biggest hurdle that I think people have though, is they look at them and they're like, that's a pool toy and I'm playing with hooks. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't gonna fly. But it, they're they're a lot more durable than than you'd ever know. That um, that's usually I, my I, pitch on them, as I tell everybody that the, so these used to be pool toys where you sit in the middle and the the bow and the stern almost touch your forehead and the back of your head when you know <laughs> because they're yeah. they're they're just not like that anymore. And you know, I so I took one out uh, to Alabama red fishing. Um, the only problem I had with them is um, with them, the way they, you know, I, I tell everybody, they, they sit on the water, not in the water, yep. um, versus, a, a, you know, a roll to molded kayak. And the only problem I had was they, they are considerably more affected by the wind. Yeah. What I, what I did to combat that, and I do a lot of videography, um, you know, besides my, my fishing is I, you know, I'll go to where our team torpedo anglers uh, are, are pre-fishing for a tournament and I will film them. I've done it this year um, with Christine Fisher. I did one with down in uh, on Lake Murray, South Carolina um, with Corey Dreyer, Rush Snyders. I've done a lot in the past with Jody Queen and, you know, in order to position a boat like that and not get in their way, and it's the same thing with fishing, you know, you can't be, you you can't let the wind blow you around. So I do anchor, actually anchor wizards or other retractable anchor spools where I run an anchor off the bow and the stern. The critical part of that is that the spool, the, the anchor in the line is is right next to me on either side. So one going up to the front and one going to the back. So that if I really get one stuck, I can reach reach up, grab the, um, I got a knife on the life jacket. It's a NRS co-pilot. If it really gets jammed in there and I, and I can't like dislodge it. If you're using an anchor, you need to be able to reach down there, 
get that knife, cut it, and say, I can buy another anchor. I'm not, right. I'm not, this thing hold me here. Um, but it takes very little weight to hold you in place with an inflatable. Yes, the wind does push you around, but it it's it's actually easier to hold an inflatable in place in heavy wind than it is a rotor molded because the heavy wind gets going and you get that wave action and that anchor is going to drag, you know, but the inflatable, you get out enough line, you're good to go. So uh, I'll, I'll agree with you all on the fact that you do get blown around, but set up an anchor and, and it's, uh, it's actually pretty easy to hold in place. So we'll move on um, past Torquedo now because uh, I think we've already kind of moved on to the fun stuff. But, uh, uh, well, I do have a, one more Torquedo question that I want to go through. Um, the one, the, the data retrieval, I think, is huge. Um, we carry some other brands, you know, at Eco Fishing Shop. But I think that, you know, when you step into the, 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 the true angler, then Torquedo's kind of the, the, the bar, you know, and, and they, they have set the bar. So um, that data... And being able to, to do like what you were talking about in the Chesapeake, uh, that's just huge. But so we see kind of guys going two routes. We see, you know, the stern mount uh, motors, and then we see the bow mounts. And most of the time when it's bow mounts, it's because guys want a spot lock. Um, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on that, um, just as an angler, uh, and, yeah. and just kind of what you see as the differences, the pluses, the minuses, and just as an angler, what you think. So I've fished with the with the bow mount on a on a jet boat this past winter. I did a, a trip with uh, Mike Breeding, who's a guide on the Susquehanna, um, and it was critical um, to to be able to hold in position and have that you know that inboard jet, that beast of a jet boat, you know, with current going this way, wind going that way. Bow mount is, is really tremendous for that. Um, you know, I've been, I've been on different electric only reservoirs with people that have the spot lock, you know, similar situations like, uh, with, with Kevin Brook and his, his torpedo powered, he's got a, he's got our six horsepower electric outboard in the back and then a bow mount with a spot lock on the front. And, and that's great. Um, it, it's a good, product it's a good solution for that hey i just need to stay here um it makes more sense to me on a bigger boat where you can easily walk up there pull that cord and get it up um on a kayak i mean and maybe it's the river angler in me i just i don't want something out there on the front of the boat that's hanging down like this that as i run into something where's it where's it going and and how is that gonna turn you or I don't know it's a little bit it's it's a I, it's a little you may not see it coming whereas if you're up on a pedestal you're seeing you know what's what's coming at you um and I don't know I mean I, I I've spent some time in one on a, a new canoe at outdoor retailer and what I felt when I was when I was in that boat is that it was it was jumpy and, and shifty um, I think there are certain models that are, that are smoother than that. And I know that you can tweak the settings. That one wasn't. Um, but one of the things that, that I think it kind of goes back to, and maybe this is old information and it may be with old technology, but I do remember reading in in fisherman, you know, years ago where they did a, a study listening to the sounds of different trolling motors to say, hey, which, which is the quietest? Which ones spook fish or don't spook fish? And the takeaway, the consensus was that they all make noise. And and even, even the 1103, it wasn't part of that study, is, is a direct drive motor is really quiet. It's not silent though. They all hear it. They all hear every trolling motor that's out there. The question is, does it matter? Does it spook the fish? And the 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 takeaway of that particular um, article was that if it's a constantly moving, like passing through the area, not changing intensity, speed, or direction, the fish are not spooked. 
But as soon as you start changing intensity, speed, direction, that's when the fish scatter. Yeah, I think I read that same article, to be quite honest. Uh, and it, it was talking about it was the, the constant twist and then thrust off, thrust off. Um, that that's did, what's the, the, be, Because it wasn't constant and repetitive, you know. Right. Yeah, I can see that. I can actually see that. I understand exactly what 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 that what that study. I don't think it, it probably doesn't matter at a greater distance. I would just say if you're if you're relying on spot lock, um, in, and that was the case when you know when I'm on Mike Breeding's jet boat, you know, last January, catching them. We weren't spooking them, but we were also at the base of a rapid where it was a noisy environment. Um, I'd say if you're if you're in one of those settings where you don't have the wind and you don't have the current, like on a, on a river or whatever it is, um, if you're going to spot lock, stay off of them, stay stay way back and make those long casts. Because I do think that that in certain situations, if you're if you're locking on to you know a place where you're like there are some active fish. Don't crowd them, you know. I also know this. People have asked, hey, isn't Torquedo ever going to do do that spot lock? And, and I wanted it to be the case. I know I worked with uh, um, the ProNav guys up in, in Michigan for a while, and they were they were interested but just didn't see the numbers, you know, um, you know, making sense in terms of, yeah, let's put, you know, let's put all the money into to figuring this out. But what I do to stay on a spot, and I'll give you an example, um, striper fishing in the Patapsco, right out in front of Baltimore, right in front of, uh, actually, there's a shipping channel in front of Fort McHenry, right? And there are big striper in there. They're, you know, mid and upper, you, you might have a 50-incher in there, but they're, you know, they're 40 to 45 inch striped bass in there all winter. Not in great numbers. There's more in those, you know, 25 to 30 inch range in there in winter. Um, but in the outgoing tide, say it's going out at 2.2 miles per hour in, you know, the, the edge of the, the, the shipping channel is, is like, you know, let's say right here, but you have this one little notch that comes out, right? I don't know what it is, but I can see it on the depth finder and there's fish on it. It's 50 feet straight down. There's a 2.3 mile, mile an hour outgoing tide this way. And there's a 12 mile an hour wind going this way. And I have to drop a one ounce jig and, and drop it on something the, the size of the hood of my F-150 to get bit. Foot control steering, controlling that throttle. I have no problem doing it, you know, and it's, it's the skill that you kind of develop looking at your chart, you drop a waypoint and say, all right, I got to align my GPS puck to be directly over that waypoint. And, you know, you just kind of look at it every couple seconds and, you know, drop the jig and, and it works. So it, it works with, you know, and I would I would contend that someone with, um, you know, with a pedal drive that has a good strong rudder can do the same thing. You know, outgoing tide, crosswind, you turn that knob for the, you know, for the rudder and you're using your, your pedal drive. It's the same kind of thing. The calculation of what you're doing in this computer is is far superior to whatever technology that you're relying on the combination of a trolling motor in conjunction with a, you know, depth finder chart. So it's, it's the sort of manual intuitive, like brain power versus, Hey, let's, let's load up all this technology. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah very cool. Jeff, uh, Travis was telling me that you've got a, a soft spot for some small mouth. Absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to be on the water tomorrow morning uh, on the Susquehanna River with my buddy Jake, who Jake Harshman just, I think he got third in the Hobie Bass Open Series on that river over the weekend. 
and uh, he's going to help me film a couple things for for the YouTube channel, uh, the little stuff. Um, we actually had some guys uh, flip kayaks <laughs> in oh. this tournament, and we're going to go. We're going to. I'm actually going to put the the uh, scuba mask on and see if I can help this help a, a friend recover some of his rods. We know where it where he flipped, but we're going to do a video on. I think first we're going to stop start with some top water, and I'm going to do a video on um, proper buzz bait form targeting that push water, that water that accelerates right before the drop, and then we'll we'll do a video on um, on something I call the rock brooch. So, say the current is moving this way, and you have a rock here, and when your kayak comes into it, what happens is boom, people bump into it, and they view the rock as the hazard. The rock is not the hazard. It's intuitive that you lean away from the rock, right? The real hazard is all this water that's piling up on the on the upstream side. And what that's going to do is, is it's going to flip you in that direction. What you need to learn and what we're going to teach with, with the video, and I'm going to get like the, the GoPro down and we're going to see me go whoa and flip right it's 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 the best way to have a really uh great click through rate on that youtube thumbnail is jeff little flipping the kayak right? <laughs> um what you should do and what i taught for 10 years as a kayak fishing guide and an aca you know paddling instructor when you hit that rock you got to lean into it and all that current deflects underneath it and then you can move around and, and get down there safely so very cool jeff what do you uh as far as uh not east coast and maybe even some midwest what do you have any any bodies of water that you uh, are pretty partial to that you like to try to hit whenever you come through so i've been on in um i think it's northeast Oklahoma. I've been on the Illinois River twice. That's been a very good, good smallmouth fishery. And it, it still is, you know, it, I consider it an Ozark smallmouth stream, even though you're starting to get into that, you know, different topography, more, you know, more arid and, and flatter. It's coming out of the, the Ozark Mountains. It's just one little part of it in, in Northeast uh, Oklahoma. Uh, I think the first day I fished it, I got two of them over 20 inches, wow. and um, it's it's a good fishery. Uh, I have fished the Gasconade, just just passing through randomly, like okay, hey, I've got you know, I've got six hours that I can steal away from my Torquedo um, work week of traveling from dealer to to kayak fishing event or whatever it is. Um, but I want to explore more, you know, I want to come and fish with you and explore with you and, and just, you know, see more of that water. Yeah. I, it, I, I've I gone up there, like this reminds me of my mid Atlantic, you know, Eastern draining slopes of, of Appalachia, like in Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. It's, oh, for sure. Similar water. For sure. We have a, uh, um, you know, I've gone to South Dakota several times and smallmouth fished up in the Missouri Valley Range and, and Francis Case Lake and some different places up there, and it's a lot of fun. But um, I've kind of turned that off because when you come down, we've got a couple of hidden gems. The Little Niangua um, has really been producing some just monster smallies. Um, Robbie that works here, uh, we always laugh because we go down to the little honey hole of, of – jonathan's and everybody else who walks in the stores and um it the 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 niangua runs into this little honey hole and we told robbie we said have you ever fished for smallmouth and he's like nah i'm not a smallmouth guy well then he went up there a little bit got about a four and a half pound smallmouth and now you can't get him out of the river so smallmouth right. are definitely addictive um yeah. they're they're also my favorite fish and uh we can't wait to get you up here and put you on some water um be a lot of fun. Let's see if I can get close enough. You can see this is me in the in a kayak. It's like my silhouette. I don't know if that's coming through, but it's me holding up a smallmouth and just sort of the reflection of it. Uh, my buddy, it's actually my buddy Jed, who was my tournament partner when we did the River Bassin series. 
he's a tattoo artist and he did he did this and it's got the you know the smallmouth tiger stripes in there um, that's cool in in my silhouette in a in a kayak so it's kayak fishing for for river smallmouth and then the the wording below is the scientific name for smallmouth well i'd, I'd say you're hooked i'd say you're definitely hooked on smallies buddy yeah. well um so what is uh what's the largest smallmouth you ever caught um i got one out of the susquehanna in a river bass in um tournament i think in 2015 and that was actually when when uh it was uh jed and i were were tournament partners the guy that did the tattoo i'm gonna see if i can pull it up pull up the photo but it was 610 so six pound 10 ounce um river smallmouth is is pretty rare a hog um, yeah yeah um yeah that's a 20 20 some year old it, fish it was in a where's my camera it was in a tournament wow. so it didn't count for the weight but it was that fish was actually not 22 inches <laughs> it was 21 and something but our the way that river bassin was set up back then it was my three f best fish and jed's three best fish combined so we had a hundred and 123.75 inches combined. <laughs> That's a solid day. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. I'd and say. What made it what made it work was that it had been low and clear. It was that was early October. It had been low and clear forever. And um it, we had had one of these um Atlantic based hurricanes that kind of dissipated and turned into a tropical storm and moving inland and rose the Susquehanna River um, <clears throat> for the first time in a long time. And there were a lot of anglers that in that tournament blanked. They couldn't handle, uh, in, and back then, river, river bass, and it was a no motor series, but they couldn't handle the, <clears throat> the paddling skill of that much water coming down. Uh, those of us that caught did really well because it constant, when the rivers come up, it concentrates fish in certain certain pockets and if you find a that feeding station which jed and i both did you know you just sit there and pound on them and it'll reload and um i mean i remember you know bringing in fish and, and at the end of the line on the the big spinnerbait i was throwing saying you're only 19 i'm shaking them off like, oh, man. It's not worth bringing you into the boat like i need another 20 plus inch fish truly a phenomenal day of, of fishing but when a river that big, you know, and it's a mile wide and, and three feet deep right now, <laughs> seriously. Wow. Um, when a river that big comes up for the first time in a long time, everything is eating. Just, yeah. Everything is just getting their belly full. And, you know, <clears throat> that was the case then. You know, I know, I know Jake did similarly well over the weekend. I think Sunday he had three of them over 19. Um, I don't think he broke 20. I forget what his, his, uh, his totals were, but he did well. And that for summertime, that's, that's a good total, you know, good, you know, good set of fish for sure. It was good enough for a third out of, well, they have 192 or 196 anglers. So we did, uh, we did the James right out of Springfield, uh, last year and it was, uh, yep. four guys, and we caught over 100 smallies in one float. It was about a seven-hour float. And we had 20 fish over 20 inches. It was a lifetime trip. It was... That's awesome. It, yeah, it was simply amazing. I mean, we, it's, like we, it's like we couldn't catch a small fish. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Jeff, so you, you know, say the James. We, we have the James here down in, uh, in Virginia. That's the river that goes right through, through Richmond. In the tidal James, they do the... You know the the tidal largemouth is, is a great tidal largemouth fishery. Um, a lot of bass boat tournaments going on down there. But the upper end it turns into smallmouth water as you move up into the mountains, and uh, you go all the way up to the top, and it's good smallmouth water. But because there's a lot of springs, it's good musky water too. So we have a lot of rivers that kind of transition from you know the the low coastal areas of that are tied to largemouth to the upland rivers that become smallmouth rivers 
and all the way up at the top musky and then and then you have trout streams feeding into it so elevation and, and gradient has a lot to play with what types of fish are, are inhabiting those sections of the same watershed oh yeah so, you know before we got on here we talked to jeff about um some tackle stuff uh Jeff, what's uh, what's a, a good smallmouth bait um, if someone's just getting into smallmouth fishing to to start and kind of focus on? Is there is there anything tried and true? Yeah, if you're just getting into, it depends. Are you just getting into smallmouth, or are you just getting into to fishing? Uh, when I was a guide, you know, if I had someone who and I did have clients where I'm like, okay, spinning rod, you hold the rod like this, you got to hook the you know, the line with your finger, don't let go, open the bail. That kind of person, it was always a spinnerbait. Like, because spinnerbaits, spinnerbaits come clean from so much, you know, you know, you, you can run them through brush, you can run them over rocks, and they're just, that the hassle factor is low with the spinnerbait, for sure. Um, but I like to match it to a certain amount of, of turbidity. And if it's really clear, um, I'm only throwing a spinner bait in clear water if it's white water and, you know, or, or if there's, if there's good grass, you can pull them up out of there. Um, but I, I catch so much more quality fish with a finesse jig, you know, and I, I make my own, um, I, I pour them with the do it mold. Um, it's, it's actually the mold I use is, uh, the mid Midwest finesse jig, but everyone else will know it as the Ned head. So it's a Ned, you know, it's a Ned head with that, you know, that EWG bend in the hook, but I take a Dremel tool and I grind that, that mold to make a collar that I can tie a finesse skirt. So it's a, it's a smaller jig, smaller, sparser jig that I tie with a little bit of round rubber, a little bit of silicone. Um, again, I'm going to reference the, the YouTube channel. There's a whole playlist on tackle crafting, making your own stuff. Um, but that finesse jig, and I put a Z-Man, it's the, uh, the bat wings, the smaller one. I think it's a 2.75 inch trailer in uh, that combination. Like if I need to catch a quality fish, that's it. That little crawl craw presentation. It just and usually in the eighth ounce. Like I was up in Ontario um, on this last trip, and I did the installation of, with a new dealer up there, Front Neck Outfitters. You know, I taught them how to to install it on a Jackson NAR, and like I had the whole installation video done. But I didn't, and I had video of him ripping around and, in, in, you know, got the speed and range. And I think it got up to 6.7 mile an hour. And I had everything but like that dealer holding the quality fish. <laughs> and I was like, can we go out for like a couple hours in the morning? And I was like, I need to get home. Like I need to drive back to Maryland in time to actually see my kid play basketball in his last <laughs> travel game of the, the summer league. Um, which they won and I got there in time, but like, I only had four, a four hour window to fish with them. And, you know, I, I tried a couple other things and I was actually seeing fish with, um, I used the side imaging that I have the, the live scan on my, on my kayak or the active target, I think is what Lawrence calls. There's Garmin is the panoptics. I was using the active target, whatever. I was seeing fish, you know, in on a deep grass grassy drop off like where the grass super clear lake up there in ontario you know where that grass faded out and then it just dropped off into deep water i could see them and i was like yeah and I, I, there's, there's one thing i know they're gonna eat and and that was it was that finesse jig and uh we got some good small i've got a couple large mouth mixed in but wherever i go even tomorrow, I have it tied on. I'm, I, I'm only actually bringing three rods tomorrow because we're Jake and I are going to get into some heavy white water, and I just I don't want to have, especially in that that class three rapid rock garden type area. I'm like I don't need to have a lot of rods around. I just want to go pretty simple. But that's one of them has a finesse jig on it. Well, I will be 
on the YouTube channel checking um, checking that out. I actually took the NAR out for the first time um, this last weekend. Uh, we went to Norfolk uh, in Arkansas. Uh, Jonathan and I did, and and uh, I took it out for the first time, and uh, I definitely would have loved to have had a Torquedo on it because without it, it's uh, – it's a pretty heavy boat, but um, had a good time. But I don't know about you, Jonathan, but I'll probably be up most of the night watching Jeff Little on YouTube <laughs> because you're you're hitting all the buttons, the stuff that we're doing here, and and uh, um, so that that's pretty awesome. And yeah, we do a lot of Ned heads and and that here as well. Um, also, Jeff uh, told me today that he will be at the Big Bass 250, so yep. we're, we're super excited to have you up there, man. Yeah, and um, and we're gonna we're gonna fish before that because I'll I'll get there a couple days early. I know I'll be at the kayak bass fishing national championship on K at Kentucky Lake. I'm not competing. I'm just there in a marketing function. But uh, I'll be moving west in your direction after then. I have some days in between, so for sure we gotta we gotta get on the water. Absolutely, so man. Well we are super excited to have you up here. Really glad that you got on the show tonight, and uh, glad that you're going to help support the the uh, the Big Bass 250. And and uh, personally, just want to tell you I appreciate your time and um, and, and the knowledge. I, I tell you guys, you know, get on that YouTube channel because Jeff will come in here, uh, and we sit and talk Torquedo for a while. But then any little thing from. Um, uh, we talked about the different kind of rope or stainless braid uh, to use on the, a kayak for steering. And Jeff had some, you know, had uh, people that we could talk to about that. Talked about how to attach um, mounting brackets and things to inflatables. Jeff had, you know, how to do that. Broke down uh, what glues to use and what products. And, and uh, man, you're just a plethora of knowledge. And, and we really appreciate your time and, and being on the show tonight. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Hey, Jeff, before we go, uh, we try and ask uh, every guest uh, one question, um, you know, personal to them. What is, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming you're going to go back to what you just talked about, but what is that one lure that you probably never leave the house with, whether it's smallmouth, largemouth, uh, or just, you know, striper. fishing in general? Yeah. And what size is your catch board for striper? <laughs> My God, 50 inches. That's phenomenal. Uh, we tried to with, I know that, uh, that Chad Hoover, you know, made a stab at it, at, at including that that species in his kayak saltwater series, which I don't think he's doing any of it anymore because it was redfish. Um, but I think we used the biggest catch board was like 32. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, we, we used it for a season, but it was a slot limit type thing. And, and that kind of ruined it for most people. Yeah. I know talk to some other folks that want to pick up that that model and run with it using the musky bumper so that would you know the musky board and i actually went and got one because i'm like i saw one up at a, a a tournament up in connecticut i'm like that's really cool i want one where, where do you get it and you know it it folds up in a way that you know yeah if you have a 56 inch musky or a 50 plus inch striper you can you can get a legit good you know but back to the lure question. Um, one bait. One is the is that finesse jig, but but I already covered that, so I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you my number two. Um, in and that is a it's a Z-Man uh, scented jerk shad, and you can see that that bait, which is a last tech. And people are saying, well, it's, what is it? It's like a fluke, like a Zoom Super Fluke, but it's a it's the Z-Man Elastec one. And I rig it on, I think it's the Finesse Rigging Bullets. It's a smaller hook, and it's the lightest one. And I will have, I will use that tomorrow. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fish it two ways. Um, and this goes along with, a lot of what you know what I teach on the channel, but I will fish it skittering. By skittering, I mean it's going across the surface of the water at a rate where it's out of the water more than it's in there. And then I'll fish it completely dead stick. So one of those two is is a big fish 
trigger. And there's there's actually a video from earlier this summer. I was on some river in, in Tennessee. I think it was the Holston. And I just, I had a day in between. And the, the video, the 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 thumbnail of it is is a small mouth held pretty close to the screen with the word dead stick. Uh, and it was all about watching, like hanging out, you see fish that are there and you anchor up and you just sit and you watch them. And those fish that won't chase a crankbait or spinner bait or the jackhammer or, or top water buzz bait, whatever, whopper, no, none of it. They ain't touching it. Those fish you can catch if you use that scented jerk shad. And I usually use Houdini and I use the smaller one. I will use the larger one too. And when you watch fish that are they're moving in and out of a spot routinely, they run laps in a pool in the summer and they'll keep coming to certain spots. And there are certain times where they will have a body language that if you watch them, you know, ooh, that's your eat spot. That's your place where you expect there to be food. That's a place you've eaten before. And here's the fish. They come along and, and they've been just like, just wandering through. They come in, they look at a few things and then they move out. But when they come up to a spot and routinely turn around that log and go whoop, when they when they lift their tail up and their chin goes down, I call it, you know, like you, you cock the hammer on a gun, I call it cocking. They go whoop and they're looking. When they do that, that's where you need to dead stick something because it's, it's the place they're expecting. It's their eat spot. It's they're expecting food to be there. It's where they've eaten before, where they usually expect to find something. And when you can set a trap instead of entice a bite, dead sticking works. It works a lot better when you find that eat spot. And that's the bait that I use if, if I've studied them in clear water, especially summertime, and watched them, I know, yeah. You that big, you know, twenty-inch smallmouth. I may have just run off when I arrived, but I saw where he was, and I'm going to hang out, anchor up, look, watch, observe, learn. And when he does that, <laughs> well, that's where you need to dead stick at Santa Jerk Shed. Yeah, that's some pretty intense information. I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm going to be on YouTube all night, Jonathan, all night long, <laughs> watching Jeff again. Well, stick video that's a good start that's what i'm gonna do jeff again i appreciate you brother um awesome to have you on um look forward to having you up here um in uh november and stay fishing buddy all right looking forward to it see you guys see ya hey guys that was jeff little with torquito like we said in, in the uh uh the the beginning of the show man he is a just a ton of knowledge and really goes in depth and and definitely check out his youtube channel uh there is a lot to learn there this guy has been on bodies of water all across the country um and is a true lover of the kayak fishing world i mean a uh, lot of fun definitely respect that guy and uh, enjoy talking to him yeah he's got tons of stuff as far as rigging kayaks but he's also got tons of stuff of just paddling and kayak you know tips and pointers and tricks um, tons of stuff fishing related so if you know if you if you're like you know jeff and like smallmouth fishing he's got tons of information on his youtube he's got playlists for days and, and i mean hours of hours on video of, of stuff that he's done and is doing and still doing and, um seriously jeff thanks for coming on here and, and glad you're you're a part of it and, and it was really cool because you know once we got done recording uh, we just sat there and talked with him for a little bit and just, you know, shot the breeze. Really down-to-earth guy. Super nice. Um, I can't wait till he comes down here uh, that week before the Big Bass Bash. Yeah, and, you know, little things that you don't think about that guys like that have to offer. We don't think about whitewater. I mean, we don't really have really, you know, any really fast-moving water here compared to, you know, other places. But, you know, if you live here, or and you're going to go up to Colorado um, and do some fishing, or even you know into Arkansas and some 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 really rough water. Um, there's some big fish in that water. Uh, Jeff knows how to pull them out. Yeah. Um, I would be watching those videos to learn before I left um, what he talked about with uh, you know the rock being the hazard and leaning into it versus away from it, um, and what that's going to do for you. Those tips 
um, could mean the difference between, I mean, you don't want to say life and death, but it could, it, it could mean the difference between a good trip and a bad for sure. Uh, dumping all your, all your gear. Um, you know, the guy's just a, just, just a real resource to us, which is why we try to bring them to you and, and, and why we want to be the kayak anglers resource. Um, we don't profess to know everything about it, but we want to get people on here that teach all of us. So yeah, he's a great guy. Super excited to have him supporting the Big Bass 250. Guys, he'll be down here for that event. So, excuse me, great time to just sit down and talk with him. Um, he doesn't seem like one of those guys that's just kind of standoffish and does his own thing. He seems like he's just a, a down-to-earth kayak angler. Like, And that's what this, this is all about. Uh, it's about the kayak anglers, um, about the community, about um, just the brotherhood in general. Overall, kayakers... Kayakers are just completely different than most fishing anglers. Um, the community, the way it is, it, it's really cool um, to have people like that within our industry. For sure. And that's from the bottom to the top. Uh, Jeff had a really good story, um, and I won't name all the names um, that he was talking about, but um, he was in you know a national tournament that had big money implications. Um, and he said, you know, two guys that were fierce competitors – are going down the water next to each other. And he said they're 200 yards apart. And you could hear them yelling back and forth, um, giving each other tackle tips. And, and, and that's just kind of the community that we're in and why we love it, to be honest. You know, whether you're a new guy starting out in a small uh, trail or, or a local trail, or even if you're just on a body of water that's having their own little monthlies or, or something, everybody in this industry to this point that I've run across – um, it's just willing to talk to you about it and, and are, are proud of their boats and proud of what they're, what they're doing and, and really just willing to help. So Jeff is a, a, a definitely a great ambassador of our sport, and we're glad to have him not only on the show, but uh, being, um, you know, coming to the Big Bass 250. Um, again, uh, on that, we've, we've got, uh, you know, we're starting to move on some spots and and uh, working hard on getting some more some more sponsorships as, as far not sponsorships but more donations and um, and things that we're just flat out going to buy and have at that at their, uh, the tournament for giveaways. Um, we're super excited and uh, another good show, buddy. Yeah, it's been a great time. What uh, what do we got coming down the pipeline? Who's next? Who, who do we got lined up? So I think um, our next one is going to be Blake, uh, the owner of New Canoe, and. Uh, uh, and if he can't do it, we're going to have, uh, you know, one of one of his representations, uh, I believe Anthony, um, is going to be on the show uh, for next week. And some more big names coming up and, and you know, really some industry folks that, that really want to see the, just what we're talking about. They want to see the industry grow. Um, you know, of course, they want to see in their boat. But at the end of the day, if everybody's in a boat, they're happy. You know, they want, they want, to, they want to improve and innovate our sport to make guys want to do it. Um, I think we're in a great time to be part of it, and uh, I can't wait. Yeah, same thing goes for is it's the same thing across the board. Even with Eco Fishing Shop, uh, they may be our sponsor and, and and you know you know helping us do the podcast, but it comes down to the angler, it comes down to the kayaker, it comes down to that person in that in that whether you know we say it time and time again, whether it's our kayak or somebody else's kayak, it's a local shop. Uh, we just want you to to have those resources, that opportunity to get on the water and, and make the most of it. For sure. And the forums, you know, we're going to have some stuff on the forums, uh, you know, moving forward on the Big Bass 250 and and some of the stuff that Jeff talked about, we're going to start some threads on uh, and be sure to check those out, kind of communicate with us through there um, and just appreciate everybody watching the show tonight. Good stuff, man. I can't wait. It seems like it's getting better and better every week. So I'm I'm thrilled to be a part of this. I appreciate you, you guys for bringing me on here. And, and I can't be more thankful than I am. A lot of fun, guys. If you're not in a kayak, get in a kayak. Get out there and start fishing. We'll help you any way we can. Appreciate you watching. Hope you're hooked. Go to bed, Stella. Adios.